Hello, everyone. Thank you for checking out this special episode of Really Dicey. This is Manny, and I am here with... Jeff Richard, the chair and creative director of Chaosium. Thank you for joining us. And today, <laughs> we're going to talk about Cults of RuneQuest, uh, particularly two books, uh, The Lightbringers and The Earth Goddesses. Um, awesome. I, I, I've, I'm very... RuneQuest is one of those role-playing games growing up that... I've always seen books of, I've seen people talk about it, but I've never played, unfortunately. And it's only recently that I've been rediscovering, in a sense, RuneQuest. So I'm really excited. I, we reviewed the um, the um, the starter set recently, and it's a wow. That's I, I am sad how much I missed out. And one what what I love about RuneQuest is how much uh, worship in, in deities are a big part of this world. And to me, that's very important because in any setting, uh, the, I always look first at what the deities are and what 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 cultures worship what, because it gives me a better sense of what the world's about. Mm -hmm. um, and what's interesting about this project, um, so usually every system has at least one book about the gods. Usually if it's fantasy, you know, uh, Pathfinder Second Edition has uh, gods and magic. D&D uh, &D has, uh, let's see, they started with deities and demigods and then legends and, and legends and lore later on um but runequest has multiple books coming out so um if i may ask why is this so what what is what is what is what is it about this world that they need so many uh books about deities well I, i'm gonna answer first with uh kind of going a little bit broader and and for me and for greg stafford who created uh glorantha mythology is what underpins all of fantasy and and it's glorantha was as a setting really takes mythology and and the source of magic you know quite I, I, I don't want to say seriously because that makes it all sound po-faced and 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 unfun, but it it it's it's the foundation of the setting. So so in Garantha, the gods are real. Mythology is mythology is how the world works. It's the it's the 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 underpinnings of everything. And when your character when you're playing RuneQuest, your character's relationship with a god or with spirits is amongst the most important relationship your character has in that setting it's the source of your magic it's a it's a source of community it's a a source of goals and directions and uh so that's always been a really really key part of the setting and it's there's um you know there's more than about a hundred significant player uh cults of gods that would be of interest to possible player characters at least to the G or or to gms and so you know from the very beginning back in the the rq2 days in the the early 80s we came out with a book called cults of prax which i think was the first really attempt to to play around with the mythology of fantasy in an rpg setting and the the light bringers in the earth uh, Earth Goddesses are the first two books of a nine or ten book, depending on how you want to count it, nine or ten mm -hmm. book series uh, of uh, of cult books. And what that does, it broadens out the setting. It gives your characters much more to, to do. It, it, it gives us great new cults um, with new magic. But also it, it, it flushes out the setting because the the real heart of the setting is is mythology and the stories of the cults hmm. how, how would you differentiate uh the mythology of RuneQuest compared to like you know um other uh mythologies and other systems well um, I, okay I I first off I would say that that it's certainly the most co cohesive and well thought through uh, mythology. So Glorantha, hey, hey, if you think about it, in Glorantha, you have this hundred different cults, all with their own takes on, on creation, on how the world became what it is, why the world is flawed in the ways it is, etc. And all of them together actually end up forming a very cohesive story, uh, which for Glorantha geeks, they end up, they call it the monomyth, which is um, all of the mythologies 
uh, put together in a cohesive form. And that cohesiveness um, where the mythology is something that you can really explore and adds value to your game and gives your character direction is pretty unique to, to Glorantha. I, I mean, I'm really trying to think of, of other than other than arguably the original vampire. If you remember that it ha it also had its own mythology that was very important for the characters. Hmm. But other than that, I don't, you know, traditionally, and this isn't meant as a a, a slap at D and D, but the traditionally the mythology in in uh, the D and D has had has been very, you know, it's been kind of tacked on. You know, uh, 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 if you're a cleric, you pay a little bit of attention to your god, but to a large extent, it doesn't really matter who it is. They all provide more or less the same uh sorts of stuff and for the rest of the for the rest of the character classes it's not even that particularly relevant mm -hmm. and that, that's a byproduct of just how that setting formed um whereas greg started writing glorantha stories back in the 60s long before the idea of turning this into an rpg came about and i i think that that different origin of the game it, it ends up with uh, the mythology and the gods being something that is much more important in play than in most other settings where that kind of ended up getting, um, to some extent, tacked on after uh, after the fact. Hmm. The transitioning what you just said. So the Cults of Quest, I, I was able to take a quick peek into these two books. It's not just... Um, explanation of uh, who the, the the gods are and how they um, uh, cr created and have a part in this world but this is like uh, uh, almost like this is a, a book that that uh, players can um uh, it's almost like a, also a wealth of player options yes um so so when you choose a when you choose a, a deity to follow it's not just uh, a role play aspect but there's there's mechanics that help and loads character loads you get okay so in in runequest everybody can can use magic but your magic all the cool magic uh comes from the gods right you wield part of the 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 power of the gods so every different uh every different god first is going to come with very different types of magic that you get to use so i might worship the storm god and that's going to give me you know cool powers of the ability to to command and summon air elementals to hurl thunderbolts and blast people with lightning or i might worship the sun god and and be able to call down a sun spear or or um cause trees to bear fruit you know because of the 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 radiant power of the sun uh or i might you know if i if i follow the the earth goddess there is magic related to healing and fertility and the the growing powers of the earth these are all radically different. And so what you can think of this is it's a hundred different character classes, um, and, which is pretty broad. You yeah. know, we don't have, RuneQuest doesn't have rangers or druids or whatnot. You, you, you are a person. It's like in Call of Cthulhu. You play a, you, you play a person, that person, you know, has some kind of an occupation that they do. Maybe, you know, maybe they were raised as a warrior or maybe they were raised as a farmer or whatnot. But the really interesting things comes from your relationship with uh, your God, with your cult. Oh, interesting. Interesting. So, all right. Oh, so, yeah. So, so these two books, um, let's start with the light bringers first. So it looks like each, each book will, will deal with a certain group of gods and i and it looks like they're they're there's a, a, a thematic um link to them so the light bringers are they're pretty much the the air gods or the storm gods so these are the gods around that are around uh the storm god orlanth and so orlanth and his companions and in in the setting uh in, in the mythology orlanth is the the leader of the storm gods and he quarreled with the sun god and killed him bringing death into the world. And that's why the sun sets, um, you know, every day is, is every day the sun is reborn, goes up into the sky 
and then dies at the end of the day and and during the night is going through the underworld and in glorantha that's not metaphorical that is happening every day and again you know it's a world where the mythology defines uh how the world works but uh eventually everybody concluded that including orland that maybe killing the sun was not a good thing because this brought forth the great darkness which yeah, you know, it was great for the storm gods for a while, but eventually everybody suffered because, yeah, you know, there is no sun in the sky. So Orlanth gathered his companions and went into the underworld to try to find the sun and bring them back to the uh, bring them back into the world, which is why they're called the Lightbringers. So it's uh, the and these are the Lightbringers are probably the most popular player character cults. You have the the. Uh, Orlanth, who is a god of storm and an event, a, a god of heroes. Think Indra or you know Indra, Zeus. Um, you know that 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 classic troublemaking uh, uh, storm god that that both breaks the world and then tries to fix it. And he's got his, his companions. He has a, there's a, a goddess of mercy, a god of knowledge. A god of, of of communication and pathfinding, uh, uh, the trickster Ermal, who is um, a malevolent. He the, he's the trickster archetype. It's it's a malevolent, dangerous um, uh, entity that's nonetheless necessary for the world to function. So, um, and. You have other gods in this. There's his brother Humacht, who is the god of 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 death, and and another brother, the Storm Bull, who is is basically an unreasoning storm that everybody loves because it's willing to fight the things that nobody else will fight, uh, and so forth. These are all, if you can imagine, these are all kind of really classic um, uh, ad adventurer archetypes. And then the Earth Goddesses, which is the, the second book in this, these are the deities around the, the Earth Mother, Ernalda, who is the source of life and the source of fertility, uh, the goddess of the harvest, the goddess of, of, of childbirth. Again, you know, think Demeter, um, uh, uh, Inanna, Hera, you know, this, this great female archetype. And, and her daughters and sisters and 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 companions and you so you have um both the 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 benevolent side of the earth and then you have the malevolent dangerous side it includes not only the goddess of 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 treasure and good fortune but also the goddess of 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 the underworld and of you know of the dead there's the the among the earth goddess's daughters you have the goddess of spring and of new growth but you also have the angry avenging daughter um who kills everyone who has um uh trespassed against the what belongs to the earth and so again it's a great collection now these are these are a little bit different from what you see in a lot of of standard fantasy but they're also great archetypes and mm -hmm. wonderful play and so the the first two books coming out they, they that covers an awful lot of the cults that people have played uh in the past in RuneQuest, as well as a, a few that have never been published before in any form so uh they cover a lot of territory and those are the first two in the the, the first two in the series and then mm -hmm. hopefully people find that interesting enough that they'll want to keep buying the 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 next books in the series I find it interesting and in, uh, that usually in a lot of the old religions, um, usually it's usually the sky and the earth are usually the, the parents. And I, I just find it fascinating that the first two books are coming out is with the sky and then with the earth. I don't know if that was done purposely, but. Oh, yes. yes. Well, the, 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 there's air. So in this one, the first one coming out is air, then earth. And actually the the, the one of the, the, the next series that's coming out will be the the distant sky gods so in the in glorantha's mythology um like in so many you used to have the sky god who laid atop the earth goddess and they they gave birth to air right air is between the the earth and the sky and so the first thing the the 
primordial air god did is he pushed the sky, he pushed his mother and father apart so that they were no, lying, no longer laying atop each other and made himself um, a king of the middle air. And which, of course, is a classic. I mean, you, you, you see that in, in a lot of mythologies of, of the world starting with the sky god and the earth goddess and, you know, a new god coming in and pushing those two, um, pushing those two apart. Hmm. Um, you sort of answered this a little bit already. Um, when it comes to like the inspiration, you mentioned there's some there's some new deities um, in this book, in these books as well. Like where 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 did you go? Like I mean, it, I mean, looking at this, especially looking at the art style, uh, I mean, it, I, I I don't know, it's like a weird mix of things. Like at least to me, a little bit of Aztec, a little bit of Babylonian, um, uh, uh, Middle Eastern, Asian mythology, mm. and you know, um, if, if I may ask, is, where did you where did your where did you go? Uh, well, for the so one of the great advantages we've had is that because Greg has been writing. Well, I mean, Greg's passed away, but um, Greg had been writing about Glorantha since the '60s. So there's enough material about the cosmology that it could it can be its own thing. So visually, I tend to go with um, I I I tend to be heavily inspired, as you said, by um, a lot of Babylonian and Near Eastern uh, imagery, a lot of um, uh, South Asian, so a lot of uh, South uh, South Asian and Nepalese and Tibetan, and then you know. Um, I'm an American, so I've always loved the Meso, the you know, the, the the look and the iconography of Mesoamerican mythology. And rather than do a direct take on any of them, it's to be inspired by all of them and use all of that to try to create something that that is its own thing. Uh, so you know, you know, playing around with well, how in these various real world art forms, how did we depict the divine? You know what? Are, what is the iconography of uh, of the divine? And that was a tremendous amount of fun that that I had with the art team uh, on these books. And 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 I was very lucky. I, we worked with um, uh, some amazingly talented artists. Uh, Louis Muzi, who's a uh, uh, an incredibly talented French artist, um, as well as Agatha Pitet, who's up well, obviously from the name. Another very talented. Um, a French artist, and she did those really complex um, fresco images that kind of illustrate the myths. Uh, and then we had um, another artist that worked a lot on this is uh, a Turkish artist, uh, Katrin Diren, uh, out of Ankara, who again her work is just amazing. And and if you you know notice on the names of the artists, none of them are American and none of them are English. And that's been another thing that's been a lot of fun on this is getting a non-anglo-american artistic view on on fantasy which has been really delightful and but it very much shines through from the books because my hope is they don't really look like anything that we've seen so far in fantasy rpgs mm. and and i have to say the art for these two books are are amazing um i i uh, it's it's like uh, like homage to the old but but modernized as well as being the the, the writer for this for these two books co-writer for these two books um th did you have to have a lot of say when it comes to the art did you just kind of give like more like a vague description and they just went out and did their own design how, how did that work exactly well that's so um i've been working with the week for quite a few years and so he and I you know I got very comfortable with his or am very comfortable with his take on things with a minimal amount of of art direction so what I would give is I typically give a, a narrative um, description of you know this is how various cultures depict this deity and then we could just run with it. And then once we started having images from the week, we could use those as references for Agatha, um, who would then run with that further. And then at the, the end, then Catherine would come in and she would do a radically um, different take 
but still used the same iconography that Luik and Agatha had had built up. And so it was one, you know, in, in a lot of ways, these are art books, as well as being very useful books for players and GMs. Um, an awful lot of thought, you know, went into, you know, went into the, the look of these things. And uh, I have to say probably the least amount for me compared to the amount of thought that the uh, artists themselves did. Yeah, but it was very much a delight. I mean, there's this great piece yeah, so like right at the front, you know, this is an example of, of the art that Katrin did depicting the same deity that's on the cover here, uh, which was done by Luik. So you have also these very, it's recognizably the same uh, deity. The iconography is the same, but the take on it is very different, which is something that we always want, we wanted to do um, because that's, of course, how human human cultures work right we we you know we 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 imagine the divine and you know we have a lot you have we have maybe a standardized iconography but then every group ends up doing their own take on that and uh it was you know it, it was an absolute pleasure on this one it's something i've never I've really never been able to have the sort of artistic experiences I've had on these projects on anything else I've worked on. And I've, I've done some pretty, uh, you know, we've, we've worked on some pretty interesting projects at Chaosium over the years, but I think this is kind of the, uh, a new benchmark for, um, the look and the, the direction of the art. Hmm. Now, now a while back, we talked about how, like, uh, when you make a character of RuneQuest, you're pretty much what you worship, pretty much you gain their abilities in a sense we share their abilities with the divine um if if i may ask were there well, it might be hard to choose being that you've written all this uh co-written all this i should say um is there is there do you have any favorites oh well that's I, I, yeah that, I, that's a tough one to answer because at a certain point there's something in every one of the cults that i've written that that has something that i i'm either attracted to or repelled by i mean some of the later books have some some pretty damn um you know um abhorrent um archetypes that they are but of course that's all part of the cosmos right you know the world is made out of everything not just the stuff we like but in these two books i think you know um I've always been as a as a player. I always enjoy playing the Orlanth cult because it's it's got a you you have this broad range of cool powers, um, you know that's the god of the storm, uh, but it also you you always find yourself kind of propelled into adventure um, if you if you dedicate yourself to that cult. So it's always a fun as a player. That's one of my favorite cults to play. But from a writer, I think I had the most fun with the the Ernalda, the Earth Goddess, because that was something that that um, when I was writing that, I I actually brought in uh, and got a lot of feedback um, from uh, quite a few fem uh, women players in this about that you know the re that is something that rarely playing around with the the um the earth goddess and the powers of fertility really is something that rpgs just kind of but they, they don't like to touch with a 10-foot pole because it's not combat it's not you know it's not about how you know how much damage can i do there but but for a community and for a society it's frankly more important than you know most of the other uh traditional player character archetypes right we don't have a good harvest what happens to the community who cares if i can you know kill some trolls and take their stuff uh if 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 we can't feed ourselves you know and and so that was a lot of fun on how do i how do we write this how do we make it interesting how do we how do we also make it something that would be fun to play and that was something else in most of these the you know pretty much all of the cults is how do we make this something interesting and fun that that i would you know 
I'd want to play a character that uh, devotes themselves to that cult. So, um, you know, I think actually I may have had more fun as a writer working on the Earth Goddesses, uh, but as a player, I always I, I have to admit I, I you know I enjoy playing followers of the Storm God or the God of Death and War because you know I'm an old school role player. Hmm. So a lot of the the, the old uh, maps usually have a, a story or a point to mm -hmm. them in some ways, um, some good, some bad. Um, what is there? Um, I mean, usually when we look at books like these, we think about, OK, you know, player options, things for game masters to use to make their stories. But are there did you, did you uh, are there any uh, like uh, not not points, but more like is there something like, hey, I want to I want to share something. I want to tell you a story. Is there a, something like it? Was there something? Oh, every <laughs> every single cult starts. So I, I know that's normally how you do it. Okay, well, let's let's let the most important thing about the carrot this cult is the the these are the player options and the you know where you fit it with it. Okay, that that's all there in each one of the cult write ups. But for me, that's not really the interesting part. For me, the most interesting part in every one of these cults is it starts with that cult's story what is that cult's story about the world about you know, why where does you know where do things come from why is this god significant um uh you know that explains to a greater or lesser extent that um that cult's story of the world and that's my favorite part every one of the cult write-ups starts with that and then after that it has another little story which is about the the history of that cult in time you know did this cult used to be more important did it used to be less important um did 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 this cult do some amazing things in the centuries past did this cult do some horrible things in the centuries past and so in in almost all the cult write-ups, I'd say the first between one and six pages is nothing but story. Mm -hmm. And then we get into the mechanical stuff, um, which you know is certainly important in play and certainly helps you um choose which cult you 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 want to belong to. But to me, I've always and I've been playing RuneQuest since the late 70s, but I've always found the stories to be the most important part. And I get attracted to a, you know, as a player, I get attracted to one cult or another because of the cool stories that it has. Hmm. If that if that helps answer the question. Oh, yeah, 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 definitely, definitely. Um, so uh, Cults of RuneQuest, this, these are the first two books. How many more books are coming? To, okay, to so we got the next one. So we got... Cults of RuneQuest uh, have started with a Prosopedia. Actually, I have a few of these that I can I can I can show you. Oh, so we have the Prosopedia, which went on sale um, uh, June I think June twenty uh, sorry July twentieth. This is kind of an overview of all of them. So it's roughly I think it's roughly six hundred cult entries. So this is kind of the it's. It's almost a reference book. Then we have the Lightbringers, which is um, how many is in this one? Sorry, this well, the worst thing about being the one who wrote all of these is you could at a certain point you can no longer remember uh, all the marketing copy. So there's 19 <laughs> cults in this one. Then we have Earth Goddesses, and then we take a break, and this will be coming out in October. This is the mythology book. And this is a, to me, this was actually my absolute favorite book to write because it is nothing about, uh, it is it is a book about the mythology of the setting. It's a book about mythology itself. Um, and it's, it's it was a very personal work of, um, of Greg and mine on uh, talking about the role of mythology and fantasy. Um, 
as well as it being a practical book for this game setting. Then after that, we have a book about the lunar cults. So these are the cults associated with the new, these are the, with the new rising red moon and its lunar empire, who in a lot of the games are kind of the, they're the adversary, but they're not necessarily bad. They're just an, um, you know, they're, they're the, the new empire that threatens, you know, where most of your character, most, most characters have normally associated, uh, been settled. Although I've certainly seen a lot of games where everybody plays Lunars. Then we have the solar deities. Um, so the powers of the, the sun and of the sky and of the stars. We have the darkness deities. So the powers of the underworld and of darkness and of the trolls. Uh, water, um, chaos. The uh, Chaos is the, uh, the lords of terror. These are the... The, the powers that that threaten to um you know ultimately th threaten to to uh destroy glorantha destroy the setting um you know in a lot of mythology the the function of the gods is to keep the powers of chaos at bay um and of course for it to be interesting chaos has to have the ability to come back and continue to threaten the world so that we continue to have that 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 conflict and then we have um, a book on spirit cults and shamanism and then a book on the um western um humanist and materialistic cultures um who worship an abstract and distant deity that they call the invisible god so i don't know how many that is i think it comes out to about 10. wow <laughs> <laughs> the books are all written it's now it's you know we 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 were faced um at some point la early last year with the realization that you know we could release this as one gigantic fat book that nobody could afford and would be way you know having over a thousand pages of material would be um although it would be certainly fun to publish that uh it wouldn't really you know it would really only be of interest to the hardcore fans that could afford to fork over uh, you know enough money for a lavishly illustrated thousand plus page book or we could break it up into 10 books and we you could price that much lower people could go and grab the stuff that they found interesting in and so we made a decision to do that and we're you know we also decided well, let's not release all 10 at the same time because again it's that that ends up just being very expensive right i mean i'd I, i'd be one of those people that would want to buy all 10 but man you know that buying 10 book buying 10 gaming books all at the same time that's that gets pretty pricey doesn't it <laughs> well do me a favor and string it out over a while and so that's precisely what we've done in this so although but although having a that set though it must be i can imagine that how good it's going to look on on the shelf Oh God! And like every one of them, I, and again, this is this is this is people watching this. I'm I, I I've been traveling an awful lot, so I'm 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 rambling a, a tremendous amount. But all of them have you know little runic symbols that symbolize what the subject matter of the book is. They line up beautifully. Man, these are going to look gorgeous on the shelf. Mm. But they're even better looking on the inside. I. <laughs> I don't know. You, you, uh, I could show pictures up, or maybe you have some pictures that you can you can show the audience there. But uh, they are. Oh, why not? I'm just gonna. The. I mean, I just let me just you know this is. The avenging daughter. The goddess of the herd animals. I mean, there's just a lot of beautiful artwork in this. And so even if they'll look great on the shelf, they'll look better just opening the book up and mm. through them. Yeah, it's designed wonderfully. Um, I have a question to ask, but it, it might be a little personal. Uh, so, so we can we can skip it <laughs> if it's if it's, still, it's about Greg, uh, Greg Stafford. Yes. So 
um, being that you've, you've looked over um, his work, seeing what he was working on, knowing what he worked on previously as well, um, what do you feel was his his goal for uh, for Rome Quest? Uh, it, 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 do you feel that? What do you think? What was his personal story? What was something he wanted to share with with um, with, with fans? I think Glorantha was an so for 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 Greg Renquest was a, a it was a very um, personally important project because with Renquest it allowed it's a vehicle by which we you know we postmodern Western materialists can play around and start exploring mythology which is something that is both tremendously important to us as human beings. I mean, we're, we're, we're still mythological creatures. That's how we understand the world is, is we, we, we understand the world in terms of, of sacred stories and archetypes and narratives. We, 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 you know, we're not really the scientific materialists that we like to pretend we are, but we're, we don't have a lot of ways to explore that. And what Glorantha was for Greg is it's a fictional world that nonetheless has as authentic as we could make it, certainly as authentic as he could make it. And Greg was a passionate scholar of mythology, um, that it, it was a well-grounded and well thought through mythological system that we could explore and we ourselves as, as gamers could build upon and experience things that we don't have a lot of opportunities to experience that in our modern life. And so for Greg, that was a tremendously important thing um, and tied into his, his take that role-playing games was a tremendously important art form. You know, it, it's no wonder you know, think about the two games that Greg was most associated with, RuneQuest and Pendragon. And both deal with with a lot of um you now both are very very obviously they're very linked and very similar at a certain level, but they deal with a lot of really important stories about what it means to be a human. And, you know, so at the risk of, of um, you know, sounding a little bit too um, artsy fartsy about it, I think Greg, for, for Greg, RuneQuest was, was a, it was a tremendously important way that we could explore things, we players and game masters could explore and make our own. Um, some sort of of mythic experience in a world that largely is devoid of opportunities. Hmm. I, I don't know how cohesive that thought was, but <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, I mean, think about it. This is what we get to do in a role playing game. You know, we get to explore um being someone than ourselves in a setting other than our office, our home. And we can do it safely, right? Because, you know, I don't have to go in and go through some, you know, initiation rite that, that could kill me um, in order to gain a divine connection and room quest, you know, my, my character does that, uh, you know, but I, so I'm a, I'm a degree removed from all of that. Because you know, mythology is all fictional. My character is fictional, but I'm still dealing with 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 archetypes and concepts that are, you know, at some some level, arguably universal, and and certainly have been around in 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 human culture for you know as long as we've been humans, and it gives us a way to play around with that while still keeping one foot in our postmodern Western materialist world where we can say it's all make-believe. And that's, that's a great thing. Don't you think, hmm. you know, it's the same thing with Pendragon, you know, we get to play around with, with, um, uh, you know, having these, these ideals 
that it's impossible for us to achieve because we're, you know, the, the, you have these chivalrous ideas, but we're just knights who at the end of the day, we're basically thugs, but we have these ideals and we have this disconnect here and we can explore it because that's the basis of so much of literature. And mm. RuneQuest is kind of the flip side of that. Well, at the same time, it's a setting that you can play a duck, you know? <laughs> <laughs> And, but that's also important because, you know, this is, this is an, uh, you know, this is the flip side that we don't explore mythology often enough is we take it, we take it both not seriously enough, but we treat it too seriously. We forget the amount of humor, the amount of absurdity that are in most people's sacred stories throughout all of history. And that's mm -hmm. well, you know, in, in Glorantha and RuneQuest, that's why we have ducks. <laughs> it, it, I just want to touch on real fast that uh, these two books, and I was very surprised by this because usually um, the 80 books tend to focus on the human's perspective, but there's like, there's dwarven gods, there's elvish, elvish gods, elven gods. Yes. Um, uh, uh, was, was that, was that fun to put together? Oh yeah. I mean, I love dealing with non-humans because one of the goals in, in whenever we write on uh, in RuneQuest and in Glorantha is that the non-humans are not just a facet of humandom. They are, so the elves in Glorantha, they are, they're plant people. You know, they are, they are sentient plants. They, they might look like a person, but they're vegetables. Uh, they have a different, a completely, they have a different ecosystem. They have a completely different set of, of, of goals, priorities, and ways of understanding the world. But at the same time, they have a mythology and that mythology fits in this overall big picture. Same thing with the dwarves. When we get to the darkness book, that is most of the worshipers of the darkness. I mean, humans don't tend to worship. The, the the powers of the underworld and of the dark that's stuff that we propitiate that we worship the light bringers to make sure that we don't have to deal with the dark right um uh, uh but the 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 trolls of glorantha they worship the darkness that's where they come from that's their that's their comfort zone and so that's a fun book in that it's mostly a non-human perspective on the world but it's fun to write that uh, I mean, I have to say, as a writer, Glorantha, writing Glorantha and RuneQuest material is just a delight because, you know, you really get to, you get to run with things and you get to run with, with ideas um, and, you know, you're, 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 you're playing around with a lot of, of, of pretty ancient uh, stories and, you know, as a writer, that's just a delight. Is there any last words, anything you want to share before we wrap up? Well, I'm hoping, I, and just as an aside, I'm hoping I haven't sounded entirely too um, that 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 these are these are just books of important art. They're also, I mean, RuneQuest is my absolute favorite um, RPG. I love Call of Cthulhu. I love Pendragon. I play D and D. I I I I have been playing role playing games since the late seventies, and and um, at the end of the day, these books are there for, to make RuneQuest um, broader and even more accessible for players. But at the end of the day, they're intended. You know, not to be something that you read over and argue about on internet forums, but they're there so for to play, and and I'm really proud that I think that's really come out in these books is that it's it's a combination of kind of the art, but also as being useful um, uh, game books. So you know. I'll, I'll see how other people think how good of a job we did on 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 pairing those two uh, design goals together. But, you know, uh, on the part of Chaosium, I think we're all pretty stoked um, about how these things came out. I mean, I think they they, you know, I'm obviously biased, but they 
I, you know, their books we're particularly proud of. And I think you guys will, people will just have a tremendous amount of fun with them. I, so I, I obviously I haven't played RuneQuest as much. Oh, definitely not as much as you. Danny, you've got but... to, man. I'll run it for you. You go into you go to you go to a con with me, and I'll run. I'll run a game for you. Well, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna keep you to that promise. I I would I I will be happy to do that. But what what I so Pendragon we 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 just recently reviewed the starter set, and what I find interesting with RuneQuest and Pendragon is that. Pendragon, I feel like it's a lot like if if if, you, if anyone has seen the Green Knight movie, uh, definitely go watch it uh, because it, it it's actually some sort of some similar themes. Is that the Pendragon? I feel like it's a yeah, you're you're a knight and there's 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 action, but it's almost like a more like a you're exploring what chivalry is, and and with Rune Quest, it's it's I I I cannot equate that with D and D. This Rune Quest very much feels its own thing. It feels like I don't want to say like a spiritual quest, or it's because it, when I say that, when people hear that, people oh yeah, like, people oh. it turns people off because it's like, yeah. oh, well, that sounds terrible. Um, yeah. but, but but there's just something special about it. Like it's it's different. It's a it's such a different feel because the the gods are are intertwined in everything, and and you're a part of that. And there's there's stories that need there's there's quests that need to happen. There's stories that need to be finished, and you're a part of that. Kind of like, oh, the, like I, the Odyssey. Yeah, very much so. And, and well, you know, um, and big influences in writing this. I when, when I started started this, there were actually a couple books that I decided I would just I would just reread. I'd read them before, but I I reread uh, the Iliad, reread the Mahabharata. Which, by the way, if you're a gamer and you've not read that, you are you are selling yourself out. That is that is that is that is RPG gold there but i also reread um uh Zelazny's lord of light which is uh you know one of the in my opinion one of Zelazny's best to get really into that um yeah, the mindset of stories where where the gods interact with human with with mortals actually let's not say humans with mortals and and the, the stories and um you know Gilgamesh, you know which the, the the whole bit of Gilgamesh. Gilgamesh is the most mighty mortal ever. I mean, he wasn't just he wasn't just half god. No, 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 no. He was mm -hmm. two thirds god. Which I always kind of tried to figure out the math on that. But you know, he was as awesome a mortal could be. But he is doomed to die, and he knows that. And the whole you know the whole story is that exploration of you know I'm. I, I'm I'm so often awesome. I can you know I can kill the divine bull. I can cut down the cedar trees. You know I can do almost anything, but I am ultimately immortal. And uh, there are there are issues, you know, elements in in being a mortal being that even Gilgamesh can't overcome. And you've got that in RuneQuest. You know you've got your character. You know RuneQuest uses the same um brp system is call of cthulhu and pendragon and so your your rune quest character might be you know able to hurl a mighty thunderbolt or or make themselves you know be a terror on the battlefield for a while but it's still it's still the same rule system is called cthulhu you know combat you're never going to, combat is always going to be a dangerous thing your character is always going to be mortal at a certain level and that that tension between you know the the power your characters are able to get through the cults while at the same time their their fragility by being a a using the brp system it's a tremendous source of of really unique role-playing ideas you know because you're 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 your character doesn't, as you progress and become more powerful in RuneQuest, you really don't become, you could become for limited periods of time through your magic, you can become virtually unstoppable, but that magic doesn't restore itself, you know, by by taking a nap. Uh, you, you've cast it, that's, that's gone for a long time, that might be gone for the rest of the, you know, 
the next four or five sessions, depending on, on what you're all doing. And you're back to being as weak as a Call of Cthulhu character. And to me, that, 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 that combination of mortality and divinity is a wonderful source of fantasy ideas. And that's very unique to RuneQuest because, you know, mo and, uh, most game systems, when D&D, you know, you work your way up to 13th, 14th level, you're, there's nothing much, you know, the, the part of the reason D&D has to worry so much about game balance is there's really nothing that threatens you when you're at that level other than really tremendously powerful things, right? That's just how the leveling system works. Whereas RuneQuest, you never level. You know, you're still that same, you might've gotten a little marginally, you know, maybe your constitution went up a little bit or your strength went up a little bit um, over this, or maybe not. You know, you maybe have gotten a heck of a lot more skilled at doing things. But what you've you've hopefully done is you've 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 built up a lot of magic with your your cult, but you're still just that ordinary, fragile, call of Cthulhu kind of character um, traveling through the world. And to me, that that creates this wonderful, rich contradiction that's great for for fantasy RPGs. But I can't really think of other than, again, other than Pendragon, I really can't think of anyone who does that really plays around with it. I guess, I guess I, Warhammer, Warhammer fantasy does, but you never get out of, you never get out of the mud in, in uh, Warhammer fantasy, do you? You're, you're, you're always covered in shit. Um, <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, no, I, I agree with you on that. It's it's one of the things that keeps me, um, you know, I've been a RuneQuest fan since the RQ2 days. And it's part of the reason that I, that it, it keeps pulling me back into it. Um, even before I was with Chaosium is, is that real different feel. And it, um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll hazard, I'll get my marketing people upset at me, but I'll hazard the part of it is there's a spirituality to it. I think that's a, a great way to end this segment. Um, uh, uh, viewers, um, uh, I am not as familiar as RuneQuest. Uh, if there's any of the, the deities in these books that you like, that you think I should pay special attention to, please let me know in the comments below. Um, cause there's a lot of great ones. I, I, again, I, I, I just kind of looked through this a little bit and there's some, some, uh, the, the God of Thieves, uh, oh, land brawl. Like <laughs> there's someone I want to, uh, uh, keep a close eye on as well as, um, oh, what was her name? You just mentioned her, the one about the revenge. The beast um, gore, the avenging yes. daughter. Yes. Yeah. Baron Gore, the earth shaker. The goddess of earthquakes and the the all the destructive things the earth can do. And you know, I grew up in California, so I I, I learned to properly fear the the angry side of the earth goddess. So yes, Jeff, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us about. Oh, it's my pleasure. And and you got to take me up on that opportunity. I would or my offer. I would absolutely love to run a game for your, for of RuneQuest for you at some convention in the uh, in the future. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, and um, yes, uh, viewers, uh, thank you for watching. Um, please like and subscribe. Um, let me know your thoughts about the deities in the comments below. And stay safe out there. Have a great day, everyone.